Hello, um, uh, this is Helen Woods for Dean. I'm currently the Deputy President of the Scottish Pagan Federation. Um, I live up in Orkney and uh, about three years ago I was involved in the culmination of uh, the installation of a memorial um, for the uh, those historically accused of witchcraft in the Orkney Islands. Um, and I've been asked to talk about this project a little bit. Well, it started back in 2013 uh, when myself and my very good friend, Dr. Ragnar Losland, who I know as Raggy, which is a lot easier to say, um, we worked for between uh, up until 2019, we worked with the Orkney Heritage Society to install a small memorial to the victims of Orkney's witch trials. Um, and the original inspiration for the project came from a lecture given by Professor Liv Williamson in 2012. Uh, she had been invited by the Centre for Nordic Studies, part of the University of the Highlands and Islands, um, and in her lecture, she made comparisons between the witch trials in northern Norway with those in Scotland. And she spoke about the modern memorial at Stanaset in Finnmark in Norway. And so we, we knew immediately, Raggy and myself, that an installation of the scale at Stanaset was unlikely to be viable in Orkney. Um, but we also knew that discrete memorials to those accused of witchcraft already existed elsewhere in the in Scotland, uh, and they had all been met with some quiet approval from the public. For example, we knew that there was a, a brass horseshoe plaque laid at Paisley to commemorate the execution of seven people accused of witchcraft there in 1697. And then, oh, sorry, this is my cat making a noise. And then there's a memorial at Forfar Loch Country Park, which is a simple headstone in the clearing inscribed with the words, the Forfar, which is just people. So from its inception, uh, we chose Galoha in Kirkwall as our preferred location uh, because this had been the site of public executions up until about 300 or so years ago. Now, Galaha is situated at the top of a road and an area known as Clay Lone, and it has a fairly magnificent view over the city of Kirkwall. And today, um, the area we were considering for our memorial takes the form of a bare patch of green land. It's really quite strangely undeveloped amongst some otherwise quite densely built residential housing. Um, a lot of people we found out um, don't know why it's it's undeveloped. So it was it was quite interesting, but it's just a bit of green amenity land. And the initial preference was that our installation would be sited directly within the circular area of box hedging, which allegedly marks the site of the town gallows in the past. A number of ideas and materials were discussed, including a sundial, because we liked the symbolism of sunlight as a natural positive image together with time as a healer. Um, the design of the sundial was taken from the grave slab of Patrick Prince, who died in 1673, which can still be seen in the south side of the west end of the nave of St Magnus Cathedral. Um, and the original idea, we had this idea that there would actually be like a, a standing stone shaped like one of our, our World Heritage Sites standing stones, stones of Stennis, inscribed with a memorial text and with a, uh, an, an actual sundial uh, as part of the design. Um, that was our original plan. Um, and we started to raise awareness and interest in the project by consulting with interested uh, parties which included local officials, heritage charities and organisations, and community representatives, faith representatives and res residents. Um, the land at Galaha belongs to Orkney Islands Council and it was suggested that the proposal be put to their asset management subcommittee with a detailed report to elected members, that's, that's elected councillors. 
Um, Orkney Islands councils advised that their preference was to communicate via a lead organisation rather than with individuals. And so Raggy and myself approached the Orkney Heritage Society uh, because they had expressed interest and they had an excellent reputation. And they also had an experience of successfully de delivering heritage projects. A final reason for approaching the Orkney Heritage Society was that their founder, Ernest Marwick, had himself done extensive research on the Orkney witch trials and had made relevant court records available in transcription. Um, and this would have been sort of like back in sort of like the 1950s when Ernest Marwick was very, very active um, with making this sort of like history known to the public. Um, the committee of the Orkney Heritage Society responded very supportively to our detailed proposal, but they raised quite a few uh, practical concerns about the costs and the future maintenance, the viability, the insurance, and most importantly, the health and safety issues associated with a metal gnomon, that's the part of the sundial that the shadow is cast from, um, which would be sticking out at eye level on the sundial. Um, so in response to these concerns, we simplified and reduced our memorial design and our revised suggestion was to exchange one of the existing flagstones leading up to the circular box hedging area with a simple inscribed piece of blue-grey Orkney sandstone. And then the sun dial just rendered in a symbolic and abstract form rather than a functional form of telling time. And we put on it a suggested inscription of they were just folk in Orcadian dialect, which I will translate a little bit later. Um, the design we chose was intended to be sensitive and decorative without being macabre or offensive. Um, this all met with approval by the Orkney Heritage Society and the proposal was accepted by Orkney Island Council's Asset Management Subcommittee on the 2nd of June 2016. Um, we then formed uh, a subgroup within Orkney Heritage Society for the purposes of advancing this project. Um, there were six people in the subgroup. They were chaired by Spencer Rosie, and there's myself and Raggy. And then we were joined as well by Tanya McGill. She had um, experience with making funding proposals. Uh, Lucy Gibbon, who had archive experience. And Hayley Green, who had project management experience. Um, early in 2018, Tanya uh, put in a funding application to Orkney Island Council's Cultural Fund, which awarded us £1,000 towards the installation, uh, which had to include a creative day and inauguration events. And Orkney Island's Council advised that we didn't need any additional permissions. Uh, planning permission was not required and we'd already been granted uh, permissions by elected members in 2016. That all stood, as long as the installation was to the standard expected by Orkney Islands Council, and they said that this would be mostly easily achieved by using one of their approved builders. Um, so we approached Orkney Builders Limited, and they generally, generously offered to complete the installation free of charge, which is just brilliant. Um, as you can possibly imagine, a £1,000 doesn't go that far. So to make and carve the memorial itself, we um, got in touch with Colin Watson. Um, Colin had previously been the um, stonemason at St Magnus Cathedral and he'd just retired. Um, and we wanted to build in as many links with the cathedral as possible because the cathedral and the church, the Kirk Presbytery, had, been, had had an historic involvement in the trials. Um, and there's actually um, one of the ways in which St Magnus Cathedral is, is unique is that it has a, a dungeon built into it, which is known as St Marwick's Hole, which is um, legend says that some of the accused witches were held in Marwick's Hole. So we wanted to build in this kind of connection with the cathedral. Um, Colin Watson procured a suitable flagstone for it. He shaped it. He carved our chosen design upon it. And being a native speaker of Orcadian dialect, he translated our phrase, they were just folk, 
into Orcadian um, and he completed the carving in early August 2018 and the physical installation took place in 2019 and the translation was uh, they were choose to folk. And so all the members of the project working group were very keen to involve the Orkney community as much as possible and we chose Tuesday the 30th of October 2018 to hold a creative working day uh, for a, a workshop. Um, this was the uh, nearest date to the traditional festival of Samhain and also within the school holidays and we wanted to make our day accessible to families. And Aggie and I facilitated a day of creative and reflective activities around the whole concept of witchcraft trials. We wanted to focus on their relevance to contemporary society by reflecting on how easily people still blame others. Um, I felt really strongly that as a historical project, if it was only focusing on the past, and it didn't cause us to reflect and think about how we behave in the present and how we will improve our behaviour in the future, I didn't think it was going to be as valuable an exercise. So I kind of like wanted to bring, I wanted to bring it up to date, I wanted to bring compassion into it and I wanted to bring into it some sort of understanding of what can make a society suddenly start accusing people of, of really some quite bizarre things, actually. The whole intended end product was that the Orkney community was going to produce some material to go into a time capsule that would be buried under the memorial stone at Galahad. This was the whole purpose of our creative day. And we had about 40 people attend our creative day. In the morning, we provided some historical background. Um, this was a stimulus to creativity. And we had material from the Orkney Art Archive from Lucy Gibbon. Uh, Dan Lee presented some recent relevant archaeological finds. And Sarah Jane Gibbon sang some Orcadian folk songs about witchcraft trials. Uh, Marita Look um, told us some Orkney folk stories ab about the witch trials. And after lunch, uh, we held creative writings and our participants were encouraged to make music, to tell stories, to write, to paint and to print. And lots of Orkney's talented writers, artists, musicians and storytellers contributed by performing and running our workshops. Sheena Graham George made digital voice recordings of workshop participants, participants reading out the names of the recorded victims of the Orkney witchcraft trials. Um, I took part in that and I was just recorded when I was just given this list of about 50 names and just told to read them. Um, uh, my personal experience is that you get to about name 20 and then your voice just catches. It's kind of like you just kind of like the names just keep coming and you kind of like realise all these people that were needlessly accused and, and murdered. Uh, and then Jeannie uh, Buzarose led a printmaking sessions where we printed colourful designs based on traditional productive marks such as the witch's rose. Amber Connolly led a creative writing workshop inviting participants to write poems or short stories prompted by a collective brainstorming on the theme of whispers and Marita Luck took, taught participants an Orkney folk story aided by drawing. Corwin Brock led a songwriting workshop where participants chose lines from genuine 17th century poetry and we put it together as the lyrics for a special memorial song and Corwin put the words to a known melody from the period and composed a second part using the words from Christian Gow's charm. Now, Christian Gow was accused of witchcraft historically. Um, in, he was tried in 1624 because he had tried to cure a bewitched or forespoken horse using this charm. Three things hath the forespoken, heart, tongue and eye almost. Three things shall the mend again, 
Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So you can see that those people who are use, being accused of witchcraft are using a very form of heavily Christianized folk magic. Um, so it really makes you wonder, well, how come they could be accused? So Raggy ran one of the workshops which involved writing letters to some of the accused victims of the witchcraft trials. Um, she was trying to do this as a way of communicating with the past and future. And the workshop participants in the present wrote letters addressed to the past victims. These are named individuals whose court records had been preserved and the participants were trying to let them know how their future now views the trials they underwent. These letters were then preserved in a time capsule which was buried under the memorial stone, um, intended to be discovered and opened at an unknown point in the future. The letters would thus become letters from 2018 to an unknown future, letting people of the future know how we view the witchcraft trials. In preparation, Raggy had made victim profiles with silhouettes, symbolically representing a selection of the accused victims, each accompanied by a list of the crimes for which they'd been taken to trial. To raise awareness ahead of the creative day, the victim profiles were posted on our project's Facebook page, and this inspired me to write a poetic response to 13 of the victims, some of which were posted online and which has now been turned into an e-book called They Were Just Folk, um, which can still be downloaded for free. Okay. Throughout the creative day, um, the participants were invited to fill and charge a witch bottle, which had been kindly made and donated by Andrew Appleby. He's known as the Harry Potter because he's a potter, and he does his pottery in the parish of Harry, which is not spelt like the boy wizard. It's spelt H-A-R-R-A-Y. He was the original Harry Potter. Witch bottles were one of the forms of counter-magical protection used against witches and witchcraft in the past, particularly in the 17th and 18th century. They're most often recovered from East Anglia, Essex and Suffolk, but they are known throughout Scotland uh, it's possible that some have been identified in Orkney and these may be on display in the Orkney Museum. But w the witch bottle that we created for this project wasn't intended as a trap against witches. Instead, we filled it with our tears during the day. Um, and the witch bottle was buried in the time capsule with the other output from the day. Um, and we imagine it trying to convert any projected ill thoughts to kindness. Much of the material produced on the creative day was far too large for the time capsule, so it was given to the Orkney Archive to hold, um, and reduced-sized photocopies of the materials were instead put into the capsule. A selection of items was chosen to go into the capsule, including the witch bottle and a book of prints designed by Jeannie Busa-Rose and produced by workshop participants, and the time capsule also contained a USB drive on which all material produced, including outside and sound recording, had been stored digitally. A copy of the material on the USB drive is also stored on a DVD held by the Orkney Archive, and we have plans to uh, make that all available online as well. At the end of the creative day, um, we visited the Orkney Museum to view some relevant artefacts. Uh, we had some contemplative time at St Magnus Cathedral, we gave a talk about Marwick's Hall, that dungeon in the cathedral, and pointed out some of the witch marks scratched on the walls, possibly as protection. Um, and Flan, Fran Flett Holland Drake played her haunting tune on Fiddler, which was called Marwick's Hall, which she had earlier composed for Sheena Graham George's sound installation. In the early evening, myself and Raggy then provided a guided witchy walk through Victoria St Street, Kirkwall, to the bottom of Clay Lone. And this tour had originally been devised by Fran Flett Hollandrake as part of the Kirkwall Town Heritage Initiative. And although there is a more direct um, route from St Magnus Cathedral to Galahar via Palace Road, it is entirely possible that the condemned were taken via the road now known as Victoria Street in order to maximise their exposure to the population of Kirkwall. Public condemnation was a very important element of the torture and destruction of an alleged witch in the past. From the bottom of Clay Lone, the condemned would have been continued up the steep hill of Clay Lone to Galahar and their executions. We then held a memorial, uh, a inauguration day, 
on Saturday, March the 9th, 2019. And we chose this day. Um, it was a Saturday immediately following International Women's Day. And it was a way of acknowledging that the majority of those accused in the past were women. Um, our honoured guest of the day was Professor Liv Helene uh, Willemsen from the Arctic University of Norway. Uh, she had been the original catalyst for our project. Uh, and Professor um, Williamson opened the day with a short speech and took part in key aspects of the main activities. And we started our day at King Street Halls. Uh, Kate Fletcher and Corwin Brock taught all of us the memorial song, which we'd composed at the Creative Day in October. And then the St Magnus players performed a shortened version of George Mackay Brown's play, Witch, which was directed by Penny Aberdeen. And this was a very chilling and emotionally charged performance and it was performed with excellence and feelings. And then award-winning writer Ashley Angus read her short story uh, called Unknown Unknown, Death, circa 1629. And from King Street Halls, we walked to St Magnus Cathedral for a memorial service of reflection in St Ronald's Chapel. Musicians Kate and Corwin played background music from the period and then we arranged in a circle. Eight speakers had been pre-selected to say the Lord's Prayer, one line at a time in a variety of dialects and language which was, were likely to have been spoken in St Magnus Cathedral during the past 400 years. Um, the eight speakers spoke in order Standard English, Orcadian dialect, Scots, Norwegian, Ancient Greek, Latin, Orkney, Norn and Finnish. The speakers were arranged as male-female alternating voices to represent the Orkney community. And in the middle of the circle, facing outwards, the lines of prayer were each repeatedly silently back by Sarah Wilkins and Fran Flett Hollenrake in British Sign Language. And this was designed to be symbolic of the way that so many of the alleged historic victims were unable to reply to the charges. And also in a way that at the time um, there had been quite a lot of scapegoating of disabled people as, as benefit scroungers. So it was kind of like making that comparison again between how we accuse people of witchcraft in the past and how we scapegoat people in the present. Um, then accompanied by Kate and Corwin, Fran Flett Hollenrake played her composition Marwick's Hold again on fiddle. After the cathedral ceremony, we all walked together as an act of contemplation along Victoria Street and up Clay Lone, which were retracing the probable route which the condemned took to their deaths. And once we got to Galahar, a group of about 50 people had gathered for the unveiling of the memorial. Uh, we had invited guests like Professor Liv Williamson, our MP Alistair Carmichael and the Reverend Fraser McNaughton of St Magnus Cathedral. And we had previously, we had sat down and laid down 13 sheets of material. So it was actually a genuine unveiling. Um, and we'd laid them to cover the flagstone along with 13 short readings. So each reader read two lines of a poem. Um, the poem had comp been composed by myself and the Reverend David McNish. And with each reading, one veil from the flagstone was removed. Um, the topmost veil was black to represent a shroud. Then there were 10 sheets of this rather impressive red flame-like material, followed by a grey sheet to represent ash, and finally a white sheet to represent fresh starts. And this is um, the poem that we read. The flames die down, the embers grey, the wind whips up their dust. Another victim's bones decay and cry of breach of trust. How many stood in judgment here, accepting what was done? In silence, hope will disappear, injustice then has won. Remember then those that they chose and grieve at cruelty. They could not win, could only lose, accusers walking free. Pain, anger, blame and hurt and hate, rejection, terror, fear. This act demands they dissipate, no scapegoats needed here. Our witches now have different names, yet still we dread their sight. The powerful making more false claims that just inflame the fright. Truth will illuminate these lies and heal this ancient crime. Sunlight bestowed upon the skies redeems the passing time. 
We pledge to stand against the crowd when might's not right, but merely loud. Now, the last reader, the Reverend David McNeish, uh, led those who were all assembled to repeat the final rhyming couplet as a community oath. So we all said together, we pledge to stand against the crowd when might's not right, but merely loud. And the symbolism is about recognising how easily witch hunts can take place and about being brave enough to stand up as a lone voice against mob rule when required and as necessary today as in the past. To conclude the inauguration, Kate and Corwin led everybody in singing the memorial song that they had composed for the project. We had a brief pause for lunch and then we went back to King Street Halls for an afternoon of academic lectures. And Raggy chaired this and the speakers were Professor Williamson, that's my cat again, Tim Morrison, Jocelyn Rendell, Dan Lee and Marita Look. And the papers from this mini conference form the, um, form the core of kind of like a, a presentation, uh, a publication uh, that was put forward as the new Orkney Antiquarian Journal, Volume 9, um, to commemorate the victims of the Orkney Witchcraft Trials, which was published by the Orkney Heritage Society. Um, we finished today's event in the traditional Orkney uh, way with a raffle. Uh, whenever two or three are gathered together in Orkney, there will be a raffle. And the main prize was a bottle of Highland Park whiskey generously don donated by the distillery. So, and this is a project that took seven years from inception to inauguration. Um, this is a long time, but this gentleness of time was absolutely necessary because what we discovered when we started to plan this and look into the viability of it was that this was a historical set of events which are very painful for for any community to revisit, and particularly a small community. And you need to bear in mind that a lot of these people who were accused of witchcraft and executed still have descendants that are alive today. The, the surnames are common Orkney surnames, and people will be aware, and in some cases very, very much ashamed of this part of their family history. We had to go really, really gentle with this because the project had a massive potential to become highly controversial. And the Orkney Heritage Society wanted to ensure that the project progressed gently and considerately in full consultation with our community and stakeholders throughout. We wanted to make sure that everyone with concerns had been fully listened to and attended to. The process was as important as the end result. Um, we were motivated throughout by a joint belief that it's appropriate, viable and desirable for Orkney to have its own memorial to the victims of the historic witchcraft trials. Our intention was to install a positive memorial with a message of never again and to commemorate a very important episode in Orkney's history and to be thankful that this sort of cruelty doesn't occur anymore at an institutional level. The aim behind our project was to look ahead together to the future as a community, a community that is free of prejudice and remains optimistic about continuing to be so in the future. Uh, the memorial now incorporates a quiet and persistent power in its unobtrusiveness. It has a different type of potency to a more highly visible monument. You have to really search for it. The finished installation has been handed back to Orkney Islands Council and it's hoped that the cost of future maintenance will be minimal. Um, we have got plans to produce a virtual online memorial. Um, and, but we know that for now, uh, the memorial has become an additional, albeit minor, tourist attraction for Kirkwall. And it does highlight a really important part of our history. It does feature on a Kirkwall guided app launched in 2019 and we're hopeful that the memorial site may become a place for quiet reflection. Um, and there's further potential uh, for developing the site at Galahar by replacing other existing flagstones with inscribed stones 
commemorating other victim groups who were executed at Galahar, with possibly the whole path eventually becoming a line of different memorials in due course. Um, this was uh, Since then, we've also been feeding into the, uh, the work of um, uh, the people who are trying to get a, a, a national memorial um, of, and a pardon for those accused of witchcraft. Um, the project really is kind of like, it, it's, it's not over. Uh, we're still adding in to other things and we're about to start about the time of this conference I'll be joining in with a, a live action role play event which is has been funded to help the community to recover from COVID so um, in many ways well, Maggie and I have published about this event and we're still being asked to speak about it and people still visit the memorial so it's very much kind of like an ongoing project and it was just brilliant to be part of. And I have got to thank um, the Scottish Pagan Federation for it because um, they did give a, a, a generous donation um, towards the project. So thank you very much.